Particle physics is the field of physics dealing with subatomic particles. It describes the properties and interactions of subatomic particles. The generally accepted model for particle physics is somewhat unimaginatively called the standard model. The standard model of particle physics is the theory of how electromagnetic, weak, and strong nuclear interactions mediate the dynamics between subatomic particles. It was developed during the mid-20th century by scientists from all over the world. The standard model has 17 particles and 13 antiparticles, for a total of 30 fundamental particles. Together, they make up all of the observable matter of the universe. However, only three of them make up most of the matter of the universe. All fundamental particles are one of two types, fermions and bosons. Fermions are further subdivided into quarks and leptons. Bosons are particles that do not obey the Pauli exclusion principle, such that more than one particle can occupy the same energy state. There are five bosons, photons, Z bosons, W bosons, gluons, and Higgs bosons. The W boson has a separate antiparticle called an anti-W boson. Four of them are force particles. Photons are associated with electromagnetism, W bosons and Z bosons are associated with the weak nuclear force, and gluons are associated with the strong nuclear force. Interactions with the Higgs boson gives rest mass to particles. Fermions are particles with half integer things and are subject to the exclusion principle, limiting the number of fermions that can be squeezed into a small space. There are 12 fermions in the respective antiparticles. Only three of these, up quarks, down quarks, and electrons, make up the matter we normally see around us. Quarks are particles that interact so strongly with each other that they are never observed alone. They are always bound in composite particles made of two and three quarks. These composite particles are called hadrons. Now, the most common hadrons are protons and neutrons, and they make up atomic nuclei. There are six types of quarks and are antiquarks. Leptons are particles that do not interact strongly with other particles. So as a result, leptons are often found alone. The most common leptons are electrons. And along with their two heavier twins, the muons and the tau's, they are charged so that they interact electromagnetically. At the same time, neutrinos are uncharged and they interact so weakly that they can easily pass through the Earth. There are six types of leptons and their anti-leptons. The standard model does a good job at describing subatomic physics, and it has by and large been confirmed by experimentation. Antimatter is any material made of antiparticles. Antiatoms and antimolecules are made of antiprotons, antineutrons, and positrons. Antimatter actually exists, but it is produced largely in particle accelerators. Because antimatter and ordinary matter annihilate each other with 100% mass energy conversion, it is a potential power source. However, while antimatter has been found in nature, it is not enough for any practical use. Possible uses for it would be extremely efficient rockets and power reactors, but they will never be practical without a sufficient, available, natural source of antimatter. It could also be used to build a devastating bomb, but all of the antimatter ever produced in particle accelerators would not be enough to blow up a cup of coffee. The two biggest problems with practical uses of antimatter are production and long-term storage. While its use is popular in science fiction, antimatter is just as real as the matter that makes up your body. High energy particle physics involves the highest energy density ever achieved. It also involves the largest machines ever built by man. There are three main reasons for probing such high energy levels. The higher the kinetic energy of a particle, the shorter its quantum wavelength, and the smaller the area that it can probe. According to the Big Bang cosmology, the universe would have started at extremely high energy density. So this produces more interest in what happens at high energy density. Producing particles predicted by theory requires high energy levels. Probing ultra small scale is needed to understand what matter is like at its most fundamental level. The smaller the scale, the more detail can be seen until you approach Planck length. While high energy particle physics shows what happens at high energy density, it does not reproduce the Big Bang. It does not even prove that the Big Bang happened or could have happened. All it shows is the conditions that would have existed if the Big Bang had happened. The standard model of particle physics predicts the existence of particles that are not easily detected. The best way to test the existence of these particles is by producing them in particle accelerators. 
And producing these particles requires a lot of energy, thus requiring the probing of such high energy levels. The Higgs field is the field that gives rest mass to all fundamental particles with non-zero rest mass. The particle of the Higgs field is called the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson has a mass of 125.3 gigavolts divided by 3 squared. It has no charge and no sting. There's a photon moving at the speed of light. The speed of light is the speed limit of the universe. Photons have no rest mass, and it turns out that all zero rest mass particles travel at the speed of light. In fact, they can only travel at the speed of light. However, particles with rest mass can travel at any speed less than the speed of light. However, they cannot travel at the speed of light. If it were not for the heat shield, all particles would travel at the speed of light because all particles would have no rest mass. With the Higgs field, particles that don't interact with it would still travel at the speed of light, and they would still have no rest mass. However, particles that interact with the Higgs field bounce back and forth within the field, slowing them down and causing them to travel less than the speed of light, and allowing them to effectively stand still while bouncing back and forth at the speed of light. When a particle is moving, the bouncing slows with the total motion of the particle still being the speed of light. The potential energy of this interaction gives these particles rest mass, allowing them to move at any speed less than the speed of light and even stand still. However, it keeps them below the speed of light.
In order to do this, the Higgs field needs to permeate all of space. The Higgs particle, the particle of the Higgs field, is the last piece of the standard model. Its recent possible discovery shows that the basic concept is correct. Masons are particles consisting of a quark anti quark pair. No masons are among the particles that make up the atom. However, the pion is involved in transmitting the strong force between protons and neutrons in the nucleus of the atom. These are the four types of pions. You have a negative pion, which consists of a down quark and an anti up quark. You have two neutral pions, one of which consists of an up quark and anti up quark. The other consists of a down quark and anti down quark. And you have a positive pion, which consists of an up quark and an anti down quark. Next, we have the four kaons. They are the negative kaons, which consists of a strange quark and an anti up quark. The positive kaon, which consists of an up quark and an anti strange quark. There's the neutral kaon, which consists of a down quark and an anti strange quark. Then there's the anti-neutral kaon, which consists of a strange quark and an anti-down quark. These are just a small sample of the mesons that are known to exist. However, unlike most mesons, pions and kaons are involved in normal matter by having to transmit the strong nuclear force. Barons are particles made up of three quarks. For anti-bions, it's three anti-quarks. The most common barons are protons and neutrons, which make up atomic nuclei. The proton consists of two up quarks and a down quark. The neutron consists of two down quarks and an up quark. Meanwhile, the anti-proton consists of two anti-up quarks and an anti-down quark. And an anti-neutron consists of two anti-down quarks and an anti-up quark. Of all the barons, only protons and neutrons are found in normal matter. And these two are found together in the nuclei of atoms. While well, quantum physics is at the heart of particle physics, this section deals with what quantum physics shows is behind the particle. Actually, in a sense, quantum particle physics is not quite an accurate term, since quantum physics deals more with fields than particles. In fact, the particles actually only show up from being observed. Now, this is not the type of field that is meant by fields. The fields of quantum physics are more like this. To illustrate a field in physics, let's start with a room. You can measure the temperature in a room by placing a thermometer in the room and using the temperature on it. However, this cannot be said to be the temperature across the entire room. To get a better idea of the temperature across the room, you need to measure the temperature in different points in the room. In fact, a lot of different points. If you measure the temperature at every point in the room, it can vary greatly from point to point. It is this collection of measurements that is what is meant as a field in physics. To make it simple, let's start with a field that is uniform. That is, it has the same value every place. Now, let's see what happens when we add objects. If you place an object in the field like a tennis ball that is at room temperature, then it does not interact with the field in that it does not change the field. If you place an object in that field like ice that has a cooler temperature than the room, it interacts with the field by reducing the temperature around it. Furthermore, if you place an object in the field like a heater that has a hotter temperature than the room, then it interacts with this field by increasing the temperature around it. This is the way fields work in physics. They exist within a given area and fill in all that area, and they are disturbed by stuff interacting with it. A classic example is the electric field between the plates of a capacitor that is hooked to a battery. The narrow lines represent the electric field between the plates. As you can see, the electric field occupies all of the space between the two plates of a capacitor. Place an electron in the electric field. The electron interacts with the electric field, causing a distortion in the field. As a result, the electron moves towards the positive plate. This is the basic principle of an electric current. In quantum mechanics, particles are ultimately high points in fields. So it is basically how these high points interact with their field and other fields that determine a particle's property. In quantum mechanics, particles are the quanta of field, and a quanta is the minimum amount involved in an interaction. The most notable omission of particle physics is gravity. While a particle called a graviton has been proposed, none have ever been found. 
Developing a theory that includes graviton is hard to reconcile with general relativity. The other issue is that while particle physics is good at describing how subatomic particles interact, it does not explain what causes them to behave as they do. It does not describe the underlying nature of particles in their field. While particle physics does not tell us how the universe began, it does tell us about the conditions that would have existed in the early stages of the Big Bang if it did occur. Because of this, it actually causes a major problem for the Big Bang. All of the observable universe is made up of ordinary matter, with antimatter being nearly totally absent. The big problem is that the Big Bang should have produced equal amounts of matter and antimatter, but we see no evidence of the antimatter. In particle physics, reduction from vacuum energy of a particle of matter also produces the equivalent particle of antimatter. This is what would have occurred in the Big Bang since all that would have existed is vacuum energy. This leads to the first possible explanation. Since an object made of antimatter would look the same as one made of matter, it has been proposed that distant parts of the universe could be composed of antimatter, and it would look the same. However, there are two major problems with this idea. When corresponding particles of matter and antimatter meet, they annihilate each other in a burst of radiation. Now this process of annihilation would be continually occurring for regions of matter and antimatter meet. The resulting radiation should be detectable. However, it has never been observed. Since the fundamental particles of ordinary matter are charged, and the equivalent antimatter particles have the opposite charge, once produced, matter-antimatter particle pairs would tend to pull together, annihilating each other. Preventing this would require some unknown field to pull matter and antimatter apart. Otherwise, you would get a homogeneous mixture of matter and antimatter. At first, there would be a massive amount of production and annihilation of matter and antimatter. Once the expansion of the universe cooled it below the point where the production of matter and antimatter would stop, the annihilation would still continue. In fact, the annihilation would continue until either there was nothing left or that which was left was too thinly spread out to interact. And such conditions could not produce the universe we live in.
Proponents of the Big Bang cosmology understand the problem, and I propose three possible ways around the problem. One is that antimatter particles decay faster than their matter counterparts. The second is that somehow there was an overproduction of matter over antimatter. And the third one is that some antimatter particles turned into matter particles. The claim that antimatter particles decay faster than their matter counterparts is contrary to evidence. In all known cases, particles and their antiparticles have the same mean lifetime. Furthermore, if the particles that make up normal matter, like protons and electrons, decay at all, the mean lifetime is so long that this could probably never be tested. The claim that somehow there was an overproduction of matter over antimatter is also contrary to evidence, because in all known cases, matter and antimatter particles are produced together. The claim that some antimatter particles turned into matter particles is also contrary to evidence. The closest to this that has been observed are neutrinos becoming different types of neutrinos, but not antineutrinos. So, all of these proposed solutions to this problem with the Big Bang are totally speculative. And that's one is based on observable facts. In conclusion, particle physics tells us a lot about how the universe works at the particle level. It is an area of physics that keeps on producing new discoveries. It is also an expensive line of research, requiring gigantic machines and lots and lots of energy. Despite how fruitful the study of particle physics has been, its expense is a real problem.